We've had the pleasure of working with uh, Transition Town, Port Washington, over the last couple of years. Um, and I feel that it is certainly in the library's mission to be a forum for these type of events where we can educate the community um, about our own community and uh, issues that are going on here, um, as well as um, you know, making connections with some of our community members. Um, so as I said, tonight's program is co-sponsored by Transition Town, Port Washington. And to introduce our speaker, please welcome the president of Transition Town, Port Washington, Margaret Galbraith. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, as he said, thank you, Jeff. Um, my name is Margaret Galbraith, and I'm the president of Transition Town, Port Washington. Transition Town, Port Washington is a grassroots environmental organization. We are dedicated to building sustainable and resilient communities on our peninsula. And as such, we are deeply concerned about the health of our local habitats and environments here, and so are so excited to have Frank Piccinini here tonight to talk about his work with the Science Museum of Long Island and, his, uh, and their work to preserve and restore the uh, Leeds Pond Preserve. So um, before I get started, I want to thank the public, uh, Port Washington Public Library. You all have been amazing partners and done a wonderful environmental programming with us. So thank you so much. And we want to thank the Science Museum of Long Island. Uh, we, I think your vision and your creative problem solving in preservation for, um, for your, the habitats and the, your ecosystems is truly inspiring. So thank you for your work. Um, so let me introduce our speaker for today. Oh, yeah. And I just want to say one last thing. Hilda Pelsador, Pals Doter is not here tonight because she is taking care of her sick kids, but she worked really hard in organizing tonight's programming. So she's here with us on Zoom, I'm sure. Okay, so to introduce our speaker, Frank Piccinini is a biologist. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing this. Is a biologist, environmental attorney, and passionate um, environmentalist who is dedicated to restoring functional habitats to our human-impacted landscape. Frank received his JD from Hofstra University School of Law, his MS in Biological Science from Marshall University, and his BS in Wildlife and Fisheries Conservation from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. As a partner and co-founder at SMPIL Consulting, Frank provides expert testimony for community and advocacy groups. Frank also collaborates with real estate developers to inform their land use decisions with sustainable design and empirical data. Additionally, Frank Piccinini conducts research projects to further the understanding of local environmental issues and the efficacy of potential interventions. Informed by his field research in ecology, Frank founded Spadefoot Design and Construction LLC through Spadefoot Habitat Restoration Services are offered to private, public, and commercial clients. Although its menu of services is continually expanding, Spadefoot specializes in invasive species identification and removal and ecological restoration construction of green stormwater infrastructure, um, e.g. bioswells and rain gardens, and adaptive management. As a fervent advocate of local environmental steward of, um, sorry, as a fervent advocate of local environmental stewardship, Frank sits on the board of directors and is the chair of the Habitat Restoration Committee for Save the Great South Bay. Frank is co-chair of the Land Use Committee of the Environmental Law Section of the New York State Bar Association. Furthermore, as a regional co-director of the American Chestnut Foundation, he works to establish mother orchards across Long Island to breed blight-resistant chestnut trees. Frank has several peer-reviewed publications, and he is a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of the Environmental Claims Journal. Most importantly, as a native Long Islander and father, Frank aspires to bring back the health of this beautiful island for the prosperity and enjoyment of future generations. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Craig Piccinini. thing on that, I need to get a shorter biography to, to read in these things 
Thank you, Margaret, and, and thank you all so much for coming here tonight. Um, it's truly an honor to speak uh, on behalf of the Science Museum of Long Island to talk about the wonderful work that they've that they've really in, engendered on the grounds. I mean, it's, this has been a multiple year process with so many dedicated individuals. Um, thanks so much, Hilder, for organizing this event. I'm so sorry that you couldn't be here. Uh, if you, I'm sure you're hearing me on Zoom. Uh, Matt is here, um, from, and you know more than anybody, uh, <laughs> Matt is out there uh, ripping these plants, invasive plants, out by hand. Uh, it's incredible to watch. So, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. Um, so I'll just I'll get started. Um, so first, just to uh, set the ecological setting of the Science Museum of Long Island, it's it's connected uh, to Manhasset Bay. Um, so. You know, Unfortunately, the water quality in Manhasset Bay um, has not been, you know, very stellar. Uh, you know, in fact, the 22 report card, the Inner Harbor, got a D plus on this report card scale. Uh, these are issues with the the mainland, right? So, so while the the water quality is that issue, it's really what's feeding into the water that's that's the issue, and that's that sort of places like uh, the Science Museum of Long Island. Uh, so. Within the grounds of the Science Museum of Long Island, there's Leeds Pond, um, and feeding into uh, Leeds Pond is this beautiful remnant tributary. Uh, it's it's un un unfortunately it's increasingly rare on Long Island, especially this part of the island, to have these uh, these tributaries above ground. Um, so it's a beautiful habitat, uh, a beautiful location, and it's really uh, there's there's a lot of merit to to putting a lot of effort into. Uh, restoring the ecosystem for a couple of reasons. One, just you know, because we want to restore the health of Manhasset Bay, we want to restore the health of the land. Uh, but the great thing about the Science Museum of Long Island is that it, it's really a place uh, to educate folks. Uh, so not only do are we learning, you know, not only are we restoring the ecosystem, we're we're learning and educating along the way. So it's such an honor to collaborate with the folks at the Science Museum of Long Island. Uh, so what are we doing at SMLI? Uh, well, a bunch of things. I tease them in that it's it, it, another name could be the Science Museum of Invasive Plants. Um, there are um, pretty much every plant that um, you know, that is invading the space is is prevalent on you know within the site, um, and and so we are doing our best uh, to get rid of them. And it's not just getting rid of the plant and leaving a vacuum, right? It's it's about ecological restoration. We got to give a little bit of a shout out to the New York State Natural Heritage Program. A lot of our restoration efforts are based on previously established ecological community types. Um, so really smart foresters and biologists have spent a lot of time understanding which plants uh, go with which plants in which communities. And so w we take cues from the, the ecosystem, the intact parts of the eco ecosystem, and try to restore that um, as such based on a lot of these, uh, the literature that, you know, again, a lot of smart biologists have put together. Uh, and stormwater management. So, you know, what happens in the uplands ends up in our, our drinking water, it ends up in our surface water. So uh, we are, at the Science Museum of Long Island, we're trying to do our best to retain that stormwater on site so it doesn't run off and degrade our surface waters. Um, so just to zoom out a little bit, uh, what what should it be? What what did Long Island look like prior to Long Islanders? Really, you know, or at least this version of Long Islanders. Um, and, and so, this is the general condition, you know, on Long Island, right? So, it, the the gradient in this part of the, this neck of the woods, you know, the the topographic relief, I should say, might be more or less extreme. Uh, but this is this is really how it is. So you have um, from the tidal wetlands, the low marsh all the way up to the forest at Upland. And in between, you have an incredible diversity of community types. Uh, and, and over time, and unfortunately, we've, we've done a great job in mucking this up. Right? We've, we've, we've teared, torn down trees all over the island. Um, we've, we've dug mosquito ditches and drained and filled a lot of our wetlands. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, we're sort of suffering the consequences. You know, with our with our water quality issues, with some of the um, lacking lack of species diversity, with the proliferation of invasive species, and so on. A lot of folks can walk around in in, in the woods and say, "Oh, this place looks beautiful," but if you uh, are are sort of trained in, in plant taxonomy or learn how to identify some plants, a lot of times, and unfortunately, what what looks like a beautiful tract of forest is really just uh, 
it's a it's a monoculture of you know invasive plants. So we have things like Norway maple and burning bush and English ivy. Um, so how do we how do we fix it? Right. I, I I've given you sort of the doom and gloom there. We've we've done a good job in hurting things, but um, I, I really try to take a more positive note in the work that we're doing. And when I when I have the opportunity to talk to folks about this. Um, Humans have an enormous capacity to, to hurt the environment. That's what we've been doing. But we also have an enormous positive capacity to affect change. Uh, and, and if we, if we try, uh, I, I think the restoration of Earth will happen more quickly than, than one might think. And um, I think we'll be very successful as a species. In fact, you know, they, there's the saying, there's no planet B, right? We have to be successful as a species. Uh, and I, I think we'll adapt. I think we'll learn. Uh, and I think that we have to really start to embrace different fields of, uh, of science in order to actually do this. And right now, um, a, lot of, a lot of the environmental planning is around engineering. Uh, and, and I'm not going to come up here and, and hate on, uh, on engineers. Certainly, we need them. Um, however, you know, if anybody saw my talk a couple months ago about the, um, the 145, the ill-conceived project, I'll say, at 145 West Shore Road, uh, you can sort of start to get the flavor of what happens um, when, when engineers are sort of let loose on environmental planning. Uh, because they, they operate, unfortunately, under um, unrealistic assumptions. Uh, whereas biological science, uh, although it's really the basis of what a lot of what we know and do in a lot of our technologies, um, unfortunately, it's, it's relegated to the, to the realm of esotericism. Uh, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, or, or perhaps, I should say, um, the reason why it might be is because uh, biological science, by the nature of it, is uncertain, right? We, we as bio biologists, we actually, not only do we embrace this uncertainty, but we, we treat it as an opportunity to learn iteratively over time. Um, we learn while we do. Uh, and that's another word for, that's another easy way to, to frame adaptive management. So adaptive management is, is something that biologists and, and land managers really have to push towards. So basically what we do is we perform an experimental ma manipulation, right? Clearing invasive species and restoring the system. We monitor the, monitor the results of our experimental manipulation and iteratively enhance our progress, uh, our process over time as we learn. Uh, I'm not going to dive deeply into the theory of adaptive management. As you can imagine, there's a lot of scholarly works on this. Uh, but but generally, there's two types of adaptive management, active and passive adaptive management. Active adaptive management uh, involves a lot, a lot of rigor, right? Like rigorous modeling, data collection, uh, and, and you know, you're still learning while you're doing. You're still doing these experimental, experimental manipulations. Uh, and you have some very rigorous monitoring regimes. Um, and then there's the other, the other end of the thing, which is passive adaptive management. Um, so under an, a passive adaptive management regime, Learning is a, a excellent side effect of what you're doing, right? So it's it's less rigorous. The monitoring might be more observational, um, but nevertheless, it's still adaptive management because we're learning while we're doing. We're iteratively um, getting better at what we're doing. Uh, so here's here's an example of uh, adaptive management uh, using the. So, so there's a lot of theory about uh, what causes the proliferation of Phragmites uh, in a wetland. And so, uh, interestingly, it's a, uh, what we know about Phragmites is that it's a, it's a shade intolerant plant. So it doesn't do well at all in the shade. Uh, in this picture on the left here, you can see this red maple. And right where the canopy ends, um, the Phragmites begins. And now that I told, told you this, next time you go out and see Phragmites, You'll, you can't unsee this, this pattern in, in the environment. Um, you'll see where the canopy begins, uh, the, the Phragmites ends, and so on. So um, shade, shade uh, intolerance in Phragmites. So uh, the reason, part of the reason it starts to proliferate right, is because uh, we like to cut down our trees. Um, usually, ironically, uh, we cut down the trees to maintain the view shed of a water body. Uh, and, then, and then you're treated with a 12-foot wall of Phragmites that you can't see past and a very impaired ecosystem. Um, so that's shade tolerance. And then uh, salt uh, tolerance of Phragmites. In fact, uh, it, despite being associated with tidal wetlands, Phragmites is actually salt intol intolerant. Uh, and it's not that it can't take salt spray. Of course it can. We all see it in tidal wetland situations. 
Uh, but the key metric to look at is uh, it's what's called hydroperiod, right? Uh, so how long does water stand in that area, salt water as the case may be? Uh, and so in areas that have a relatively high hydroperiod, you see Spartina grass outcompete the Phragmites. Just a second over where you see some elevation relief and the hydroperiod is relatively small, you see the Phragmites start to come in. And then back here where we have a change in elevation of like four or five inches, you know, the Phragmites is very dense. Um, so we adaptively managed uh, Phragmites at, uh, at the Science Museum of Long Island. Uh, it's sort of a funny story. Um, you know, Hilder, Hilder uh, the, the president of the board at the Science Museum, uh, likes to say that I was uh, I was out there, you know, confidently leading the troops, you know, here the troops um, into <laughs> into planting uh, these willows into the Phragmites. I I remember framing it as an experiment in adaptive management. I didn't know if this was going to work. I didn't know if the willow was going to outcompete the Phragmites. But from the biological science uh, standpoint, it, it should work. Um, and gosh, you know, these these willows a couple of years later. Are, are starting to really um, do you know do the thing? They they are starting to shade out the Phragmites. I expect in the next you know five or six years, once this well, willow really takes off and gets above that ten to twelve foot Phragmites line, you know we're going to knock back the Phragmites at the Science Museum of Long Island. So uh, that's an example of passive adaptive management. Um, so I didn't know that this was going to work necessarily. I thought it would. We did the experimental manipulation and we learned uh, over time. So. Our techniques for uh, invasive species removal has also um, has also evolved over time. Uh, so when we first started doing this, uh, the primarily the primary tool that we were using at Spade for design and construction uh, were excavators. Uh, we like the mini excavators because you know you don't need a whole lot of power to rip up invasive species, and it's nimble and you can get around places. Um, so they are relatively powerful. They're good at digging and knocking things over, as I have here, uh, but. The, the issue with it is that uh, off-site disposal is expensive. So this is actually at the Science Museum where we, we took out a big patch of burning bush, Norway maple, and English ivy. And, and despite the fact that we had this big old chipper there, uh, cutting it down into most of the, the woody material that we were ripping out, uh, we still filled up I want three 20-yard containers of, uh, of you know, and this we only took out maybe like a, a 4,000 square foot plot. Um, so Offsite disposal is expensive. Uh, it's expensive to uh, ship the truck the stuff places. It's expensive to get rid of the stuff. Um, and so it also seems wasteful, right? We're, we're, we're ripping out all this organic matter and just removing it from the site. Um, so we, uh, we invested in a machine called a, a brush cutter head. Uh, other people refer to it as a forestry mulcher. Nevertheless, it's, it's just this, you know, beastly machine. It's, it's um, you know, you can see it here. It's, it's effectively a lawnmower from hell, right? You put the thing on a bobcat, you lift the boom, and the plants just absolutely uh, disappear, which is awesome. Uh, so it's efficient, it eliminates the offsite disposal costs, and it returns the organic matter to the soil. Um, so, so it's really exciting uh, because it's, it's a way to, uh, to inexpensively, relatively inexpensively, remove large tracts of invasive species without having to deal with this expensive and environmentally destructive disposal practice. Um, so this is exciting, and we've passed, at Spadefoot, we've passed the, the cost savings on to our clients. So what used to be a $10,000 project can be accomplished uh, you know, for $2,000, say. Um, over time, we started uh, using other equipment that we had too. Actually, this, this thing called a soil conditioner, uh, we had it in the yard, uh, so Spadefoot is about two years old. We've had the soil conditioner sitting in the yard for two years, uh, it was my partner's. And uh, one day I was out at the yard and I said to him, what is that piece of equipment back there? Oh, that's a soil conditioner. It's used for grading and, and, and prepping for sod. Uh, that's how it was described to me. Turns out the thing is a beast. Uh, we, can, we can actually, we rip up uh, roots with it. So after we take down the, uh, the big dense material with the big forestry cutter, we come in and, and finish it and polish it off with this, uh, with this soil conditioner unit. Um, so it rips and grinds up the roots of the invasive span, uh, plants. It really helps limit the, the regrowth of invasive plants. Uh, and interestingly, it can be used to eliminate things that I didn't know this until really like two weeks ago. Uh, English ivy, pachysandra, turf grass, mugwort, phragmites, 
all this stuff. You just run the soil conditioner over it, and it just kind of goes away. Um, so <laughs> we're going to be using this thing a lot more often in our work. Um, and we, we still continue to evolve. Um, so you know, we, we just invested in a machine. Um, it's a stand-up unit. It's smaller. It's basically a mini bobcat that you can kind of stand on. And um, we're buying the soil conditioner attachment for it. We have a grapple bucket and so on. Uh, and so you know, we imagine uh, employing this in, in places like the Science Museum of Long Island. There's this beautiful forest on the, you know, on the other side of the preserve. Uh, it's beautiful except for the layer of English ivy on the bottom. And it would be amazing just to kind of um, use nimbly move this machine through. And it really it needs like a, a three foot clearance to get by. Um, so you can get by most, uh, most trees and move quickly in a forest and leave the uh, native species intact and, and free them up from the, the strangling grips of the, of the English ivy. Uh, so, so how do we do it? What, what is the techniques that we use? And, and so we tried at, at Spadefoot and at the Science Museum of Long Island, uh, we tried to uh, restore uh, native, native trees, right? So, so there's so many things about trees that uh, I, I think go underrepresented. So the, the one, one thing to, to note is, is the pollinator, uh, the host plant associations, right? So people think about pollinator gardens. They think about you know, butterflies floating on flowers, you know, and so on. And so I have two numbers here, 521 versus 138. Uh, so oak species, you know, oak trees are, co are associated with 500, according to the National Wildlife Federation, and this is an evidence-based um, sort of data set that they have, are, they have detected or, or uh, demonstrated 521 uh, host plant associations with pollinators, uh, with oak trees. Whereas the highest uh, herbaceous plant, like flowering plant, is goldenrod, sort of a gift to nature in the fall blooming. But even that powerhouse perennial plant is at uh, just 138 host uh, interactions. And you take things like uh, milkweed and, and some of these other flowering perennial plants, you know, it's in the, in the range of like 10 to 15 or so or fewer. Um, so, so trees are where it's at from a pollinator standpoint. Uh, and that's important too if you like birds because the birds are eating these caterpillars, right? Um, so we try to um, we try not to force a meadow. You know, I think uh, the inclination is to kind of clear land and, and seed. Um, however, much of Long Island, with just a few notable ex exceptions, was historically forested, uh, and so you know we we do our best to restore the forest where we can and certainly we we plant uh native herbaceous per, like perennial flowering plants they're beautiful uh but they don't do nearly as much as trees do from an ecosystem standpoint and there's they're stormwater powerhouses uh so you know as i mentioned at the the top of the presentation uh, the water quality issues is, is really an issue with our mainland and uh trees are really the answer to uh, most of, a lot of our water quality issues. Of course, we have to get control of our wastewater issue, uh, but our atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen, something like that. Uh, and, and when it rains, nitrogen just falls out of the sky. Uh, and when it's dry, it's called dry deposition. That happens too. Uh, and so the trees will actually help uh, reduce the degradation of surface waters uh, by so many different uh, redundant processes. So the canopies themselves will actually will intercept the rain and hold on to it. You know, hundreds of gallons for each individual tree. They just kind of uh, hold it and then drip it slowly and allow it and prevent runoff. Um, so the canopies uh, will reduce the erosive force of the of the raindrops hitting the soil, uh, and will also just physically hold on to that that stormwater so that it doesn't rush down into the streets, into Manhasset Bay, as the case was. Um, the roots uh, do a whole lot of things to really help uh, retain stormwater on site. So one, one point I have here is soil porosity. So as a tree develops uh, and the root action starts to, uh, starts to you know, the roots start to grow in place, uh, this, the soil becomes uh, more porous, more spongy, basically. And it contains the stormwater on site as, a uh, as opposed to letting it run off down the street. I have a, a note here about soil accretion. What is that? So uh, basically, the litter uh, leaves fall down, soil builds up over time. It's you know accretion is a fancy word for leaves fall and make soil, right? Uh, but 
that soil, um, which is relatively porous relative to, you know, let's say a lawn, uh, will, will do a great job at holding on to the stormwater. And as the system starts to, to develop, um, it does a better and better job uh, of doing so. Uh, because the, the trees themselves, through their roots, uh, and, and through a process called evapotranspiration, so basically the venting of gas through the roots and through the leaves, um, the, there's actually, they, they've shown, studies have shown a pumping mechanism, right? So if you think about this, uh, the roots will be, will pump up the groundwater, buffering floodwaters, and build itself, and build the soil column over time and make the soil more porous. Um, so there's so many different ways that these trees are actually holding on to stormwater so that it doesn't take with it all of this road grease and nitrogen and phosphorus and all these other pollutants that would otherwise uh, load into our water bodies. Um, leaf litter. Uh, leaf litter is, does similar things to the canopy, and you know I already mentioned the soil accretion. Uh, we, we hear a lot about denitrification in the terms of uh, these, these innovative alternative uh, wastewater systems, uh, but goodness, the, we don't hear enough, in my opinion, about assimilation of nitrogen. Uh, it's very similar to the concept of carbon sequestration, which most people would be uh, familiar with, I would think. Uh, but it's similar, the nitrogen just sticks in the plant tissue as opposed to getting you know, dumped into uh, the tidal wetlands and our harbors in, in the Long Island Sound, wreaking havoc. Uh, and, and there's a connection to wastewater too, right? So um, these septic systems, uh, the, part of the reason that it's they're, they're, it, they lose so much nitrogen is because of the stormwater that pulses through and pushes all the nitrogen load out. Um, so, you know, of course we got to get a handle on our, our wastewater infrastructure, uh, but goodness, if we had less of a stormwater issue, we'd have less of a wastewater issue, too. So taking it back to the Science Museum of Long Island, uh, when, when I first started, uh, when I first saw this site, you know, my jaw dropped. It, it was... Uh, you know this this side of the um, the preserve over here. Uh, it, it's a like I said a monoculture of Norway maple, which is this weedy invasive uh, maple tree that you know where was irresponsibly planted by the way by municipalities because it grows quickly. Um, and you know in the understory is burning bush. Yes, your burning bush and your yard spreads to other places, uh, and the science museum is a good example of that. Um, there was some, you know, a healthy dose of English ivy, uh, and, and, and goodness, was there was some, you know, about an acre of kudzu out there, too. Uh, and so when we first got out there, uh, it, it, looked, it looked insurmountable. However, we made, I think, some incremental gains here. Um, here's two plots. We, we took out this, this plot here. Uh, we took out the invasive species, as I mentioned earlier, with the excavators. Um, this plot here was formerly kudzu. Um, this was 21, this was 22. Uh, and you can start to see your gains on the satellite. It makes me feel like we're actually making a dent on this thing. Uh, and what you can also see is, uh, is the development of the ecosystem, right? So these little dots are things that we just planted. Um, these dots are one year later. And I think within a couple of years, you won't really see dots anymore. You'll just see the canopy restored, which is incredible. Um, so we, we tried to use nature's plan uh, to restore uh, the Science Museum of Long Island. I mentioned at the onset uh, the, the New York Natural Heritage Program. Uh, the, the closest community type that uh, the remnant patches of the Science Museum of Long Island suggests is an oak tulip poplar, for, uh, poplar forest. Um, so you know, oak trees, American bee trees, tulip poplar, and you know, characteristic shrubs. So, you know, we're not just decorating with native plants, we're restoring native communities. And, and so it's, it's really rewarding at the Science Museum to be able to do this. Uh, and we plant very densely. And a lot of people say, hey, shouldn't, don't you need 10 feet on center plus for a tree? And it, again, we're, we're trying to mimic the natural condition. The reason why we plant so closely together uh, is because it's actually better for the trees, right? So when you have trees that are uh, planted very closely together. Uh, I, should, I should say, when you have a, a tree that's planted like a token tree in the middle of the field, they get sort of top heavy, right? You see these big, beautiful canopies, and admittedly, they're beautiful. Um, however, that acts sort of like a wind sail, and, and the plants tend to fall over. They get gnarly, and they're subject to wind throw. Also, uh, it robs them of an opportunity to graft together underground. 
So oaks of different species and even uh, other related, you know, like beeches and whatnot, they will graft together underground. Uh, and so when you plant densely, you, you encourage uh, more of the natural condition, what you, what's referred to as timber stock, like so big straight trees without an exaggerated canopy with, you know, healthy root grafting underground. And that also helps to uh, develop the mycorrhizal network. Um, so basically, incredibly, you know, the, and we're just learning about this, by the way, the, the roots uh, have co-associated microbes, uh, mainly fungus and bacteria, uh, and they, they, base, they act as an extension of the root system. It's pretty incredible that uh, they've measured trees basically talking to each other, sharing nutrients, sharing water through this mycorrhizal network. So there's this living, uh, you know, internet of trees basically living underground. And so we plant densely to encourage the mycorrhizal network. And here's a picture on the ground uh, of the Science Museum. And you can see uh, this is the, the plot that we did in 2020, uh, 2021. Uh, and, and they even these slow growing oaks have put on about you know, a foot of growth. Uh, they, they made it just fine through this brutal drought that we had over the spring, uh, over the summer rather. Uh, and, and I think it looks, it's going to look increasingly beautiful as the canopy starts to knit together. Uh, and one of the more exciting developments at, at the uh, Science Museum of Long Island is the ecological succession that we're noticing. Uh, so you see a lot of native volunteers like this fleabane daisy. Uh, but in the, in the 2021 plot, uh, we've noticed a ton of cherry seedlings, uh, which is a native beautiful tree, starting to pop up throughout the forest. So we planted four to five foot on center. The cherries are filling in all the uh, other little gaps. Uh, and you know, on, probably brought here by bird poop, right? Uh, that's amazing. Uh, that, so you know, we're seeing the beginning stages of ecological succession. We juiced ecological succession by planting some of the climax species. And so I imagine that this plot will really start to uh, heal itself and, and start to become a thriving community uh, to the extent that it's not already. Uh, and, and I mentioned the, uh, the beast, kudzu. Uh, you can see this is me, uh, photo courtesy of the, uh, the current executive director, Kristen Lard. Uh, so this is me in this giant plot of kudzu here. Uh, and this is uh, our beastly uh, mower blade. Um, so the New York DEC, uh, their program for eliminating kudzu, and I get it, is to spray herbicides. Uh, and, and certainly they put a hurting on the, on the kudzu. Uh, we, we, however, uh, realized that uh, machines work really well too. And it, it, the, uh, I'm sort of chuckling because um, we recently did work at the Science Museum in Long Island and, and, I, and I told my machine operator, uh, I said, listen, do me a favor, these are really good people. Try to get as much of this kudzu as you, have, as you can. It, it really needs to be done. Uh, let's, you know, just spend, spend, put some elbow grease into this. And he said, sure. Uh, and then <laughs> I came back two hours later, and basically it's all gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so we we now have this giant uh, patch of uh, what used to be just a, a big mat of kudzu, and um, and I think we we turn the tide, and I think that we we I think within a year we can safely say that what was once an acre of kudzu, which is uh, to my knowledge the biggest patch of kudzu. Which, by the way, is the vine that ate the South. I don't know if you know how, who's familiar with it. Um, it's it's basically gone, and all we need to do is restore the ecosystem here. So, um, you know, we'll we'll work on that. But it's it's nice that the kudzu is is not um, you know threatening uh, the the remaining forest that we have. Um, I couldn't do a presentation uh, about the Science Museum of Long Island without um, shouting out to Peggy Manslow. Hopefully, she's she's watching. Um, or can hear this on the recording. Uh, she's done an incredible job with that pollinator garden. It's taken on a life of its own. Um, here you see a lovely patch of common milkweed. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you that if you're there during the growing season, that place is, is buzzing with activity. And so, um, you know, love for, uh, for Peggy's work. Uh, so another thing that we do uh, at the, the Science Museum of Long Island, or I should say um, I get to do for the Science Museum of Long Island in some capacity, is, is stormwater, stormwater management. Um, so it's really important that we, you know, again, retain the stormwater on site as opposed to having it run off into Manhasset Harbor. Um, I, didn't, uh, I can't take credit for this, uh, this structure right here. We did a little bit of tweaking on behalf of the museum, but th this, uh, this bioswale was uh, installed per, uh, thanks to a grant by the Long Island Sound Futures Fund. Uh, and it's, the intent of it is to manage sheet flow. 
Um, so as a lot of people think of stormwater runoff, and understandably so, as, as the overland flow, right? What you see going down the street and going into the drains and ultimately pushing out to the outfall. Uh, but a lot of people, including uh, you know, some of the engineers on the 145 um, <laughs> West Shore Road project, seem to just ignore this whole concept of sheet flow. Um, so, you know, we have this overland flow, uh, and, and sorry, I'm in the neighborhood. I can't um, not take a shot at that project. But uh, the sheet flow just oozes through the, envir uh, it, th through the environment. And so these uh, stormwater intercepts were, were designed to kind of cut that off, create a bit of a speed bump for this uh, sheet flow, and keep it on site, as opposed to having it just continue to ooze down into uh, Manhasset Harbor, ultimately. Uh, and, and we also have to deal with the overland flow. We did build this one. Uh, admittedly, this picture is rather uninspiring. It looks like a, a pile of rocks. Uh, I just got the picture you know, last week. So all these beautiful flowering perennial plants are, are kind of done for the season. Uh, but what we did is subtly uh, created a, a little cutoff right here. Uh, and, and we basically, this, there's like a river, a turrent, that goes along this cobblestone and kind of just Used to historically, would just go out onto the street and ultimately into the storm drains and into Manhattan Harbor. Uh, instead, at the Science Museum, it, it kind of takes a, a hard right here, uh, based on our subtle working of the pitch. Uh, we, you know, we saw cut the asphalt and repitched it a little bit just to push it, and uh, and the, the the stones are there to dampen the erosive effects, and so. Uh, I think it does a pretty good job. It, you know, we noticed, uh, and the funny thing about stormwater infrastructure is that you build it, you hope it works, you monitor it over time, and then you tweak it as you go. And so we noticed there was a little bit of a, a shortcut that some of the stormwater was taken. So we went back and actually created another redundant channel. Uh, and so we basically take this overland flow, you know, pool it, encourage infiltration, and whatever overflow you have, it just kind of oozes out into the landscape as opposed to you know, really running off and ripping hard. Um, so you know, another amazing thing that we get to do at the Science Museum of Long Island is uh, American chestnut restoration. So I, you know, I, I'm sure a lot, everybody is getting to that time of year, chestnuts uh, roasting on an open fire. The chestnuts that are roasting these days are no longer, unfortunately, no longer American chestnut. They're primarily Chinese chestnut. Uh, and that's due to uh, the chestnut blight. Uh, so in the early 1900s, uh, it, it, start to, it started to hit. And what was once a, uh, the numerically dominant uh, species in all of the eastern seaboard was uh, relegated to basically nothing. Uh, these giant trees, there's some pictures if you, if you Google chestnuts and you know, look at the Google images. One of the, the famous pictures is you know, a bunch of people standing next to this, and there's like seven people in this giant you know, stem. And so this tree was everywhere throughout the eastern seaboard, and then all of a sudden it wasn't. By 1940, 1950s, they're basically gone. Um, because of this chestnut blight. It's a, a foreign pathogen. Uh, the Chinese chestnuts have some natural resistance to it. Our American chestnuts did not. And now they're functionally extinct. Um, and so what I mean, that doesn't mean they're not around. They are still around. But what happens is, you can actually see it here. This is a picture that I took in West Hills County Park. And uh, so basically what happens is, you see all these little stems here. Uh, the plant will grow up. It'll live to about 30 years or so. Uh, and then the, the chestnut blight will set in. It'll girdle the, tr the plant, uh, the, the above ground growth die back, dies back, and then the, the roots send up another shoot, starting the process over and over again. Um, so functionally, the species is now extinct. Um, and so, you know, I, as, as uh, Margaret mentioned, I'm uh, the co-director of the, the Regional American Chestnut Foundation, and so you know, I have a particular love for the species. Uh, so there's a couple different programs that that American Chestnut Foundation has proffered to to really sort of restore it. The the more historic one was the back cross hybrid. Uh, the idea was that we would mix Chinese chestnuts with American chestnuts, and the resulting hybrids would ha would ha be uh, blight resistant. Turns out, however, that the the hybrids that actually have blight resistance are more Chinese chestnut than American chestnut. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I think some people are holding on to this program still because they've invested so much, but it's been largely a failure because the, the genetics are much more complicated than we initially appreciated in the 50s when we started to try to do this back cross hybrid program. 
Um, so SUNY ESF, the School of Environmental Science and Forestry up, upstate, uh, it's associated with the Syracuse campus, um, has put together a transgenetic uh, chestnut. So basically they took one wheat gene and stuck it into the genome of an American chestnut. Uh, and so what you have from a genotypical standpoint is uh, something like 99.9%, I don't, don't quote me on the exact percentage, but it's like, you know, at least 99% uh, American chestnut with just a small tidbit of this wheat gene that gives it some blight resistance. And so uh, what we want to do is, uh, is, is pollinate the, so what we have been doing, I should say, uh, on Long Island here, uh, this, this actually is an old, uh, a tree stand in, a, in a, one of the biggest chestnuts that are on Long Island. This is an old Bethpage restoration. The North Shore Land Alliance have another big chestnut in the Fox Hollow Preserve. There's just a handful of trees out there. Uh, and my co-director, who's a little bit braver than I am, actually climbs up in this tree about 60 feet and hand pollinates all of these American chestnut trees, which is incredible. Um, and then he goes out and collects the nuts, and um, I think he's a little nuts. I, I love him, <laughs> you know. But uh, but I really appreciate his passion and I admire his dedication. And I've done you know everything I could do to support him. Uh, and so what we've been doing, and I've been helping him do, is uh, establish mother orchards uh, throughout Long Island. And and the idea is to plant the uh, Long Island wild type American chestnuts, so that when the blight resistant chestnut is released and, and it's going through a regulatory process and it could be as soon as 2023 or probably more likely 2024. Uh, nevertheless, when it's released, we'll be able to plant these blight resistant uh, transgenetic, you know, Syracuse uh, Darling 58 trees within the mother orchards and they'll crossbreed with our Long Island wild type. The resulting progeny will be, you know, half Long Island wild type chestnut, half Darling 58 chestnut. So it'll be you know, we'll maintain the genetic integrity of our Long Island chestnut stock uh, while making them, uh, you know, blight resistant. So we can then go out, you know, and it's, it's funny, all the progeny, you can actually, as they grow up, you can just do a simple enzyme test. And if it turns black, it's blight resistant. And we can take that little seedling and go plant it. They're super fast growing, these chestnuts. So I, I think in my lifetime, and certainly in my, my children's lifetime, you know, I, I truly believe that the forest will be restocked with American chestnut. And then once again, American chestnuts roasting on the open fire, not Chinese chestnuts. Um, and excitedly, uh, and you know, I, I worried that I wasn't going to have uh, enough content to talk about for 40 minutes. <laughs> Seems like I'm doing pretty good here. But um, I don't know if I told anybody at SMLI, but uh, you guys are shortlisted for being one of the first sites for um, the transgenetic stock. Uh, being released uh, because of the educational activities that are going on at SMLI. So it's really exciting and this is probably going to be, uh, the Science Museum is probably going to be the first place on Long Island where we have a transgenetic uh, chestnut. Uh, I, I, I regret having to add this slide. I actually just saw a prominent environmentalist uh, send around an unfounded email that um, Chestnuts, uh, the transgenetic chestnuts are going to kill squirrels, and it was just ridiculous. Uh, so it will not kill the squirrels. Uh, and, and so I just cited a couple papers here um, that where they're actually studying this. And these are high-powered, high-impact environmental journals. And, and I read both of these articles, and the methodology was sound. Uh, and you know, the, the upshot of all this, I'm not going to go through this, the upshot is that these transgenetic chestnuts uh, Goodness, the, the animals don't care. The bears are going to eat the, uh, the the chestnuts. You know, the the whatever pollinator host interaction that disappeared uh, when the chestnuts went down, they're going to come back, and we're going to see uh, a, a renewed health of our forest. So, uh, it's not going to kill the squirrels. So, um, with that uplifting story about the American chestnut, I'll I'll tell you um, uh, this the sad and really alarming. Uh, proliferation of the beech leaf disease, which unfortunately has afflicted the Science Museum of Long Island. Uh, before I do, the American beech is a very ecologically important species. Uh, oaks generally run to the canopy. Uh, American beech, obviously, is a canopy species, but they tend to spread out and take advantage of all of the little dappled light under the oak trees. So it creates this, like, this secondary layer in the canopy. Uh, and below ground, that diversity is matched with their very spreading uh, roots and fibrous roots. Um, so 
I, I'm just I'm, I'm going to skip the whole case study. Suffice it to say, my my graduate research, one of the main conclusions was that uh, the American beach root structure maintained the abandoned uh, rodent burrows that uh, ambistomatid salamanders needed. Uh, right, so uh, that's just one interaction. And by the way, salamanders of the genus Ambistema, you might have heard of tiger salamanders. Uh, that's the big one on Long Island, uh, federally threatened, I believe. Uh, but also other state listed species, which should be around here, by the way, like marbled salamanders and spotted salamanders. Uh, so it's an incredibly important um, species. And uh, they're, they, they look like they're, they're getting cooked all across Long Island's landscape. Uh, and it's, it, it's thought to be ca t caused by, of course, you know, a non-native nematode uh, that overwinters in the buds. Um, so here's some of the symptoms to look for. Uh, and, and it's just really sad. It's just really ripping across canopies all across Long Island. Um, you'll see all this banding here within the leaves. Um, that's uh, thought to be caused by the feeding of the nematodes in the buds. And, and this is actually in, uh, also in Fox Hollow Preserve and Land Alliance. Uh, and this last year, you couldn't see sky in this canopy. It was just so dense. And the way, uh, so how densely layered American beaches grow you couldn't. You just couldn't see the sky, and and now you have all this dapple. You know, a lot of dappled light falling to the floor, and it's it's just. You see these these plants are getting fried all across, um, all across Long Island. Unfortunately, um, so additional observation. This is uh, apparently uh, apparently beaches have like sort of a defense mechanism, and and they reflush, uh, and so these puny little leaves are uh, that sort of. You know, they're sort of yellowed and doesn't have a lot of chlorophyll. This is the, the tree's response to its buds basically failing. Uh, but it is a little bit encouraging because uh, I was walking around a bunch of preserves this July getting honestly a little depressed uh, because it just looked like these beautiful 100-year-old trees were dying and they just looked completely cooked. And I said, gosh, is this a dead tree? And then I came back a couple months later and they, they reflushed. So nature sort of finds a way and we're hopeful that um, we could do something about it. So what do we do about beech leaf disease? Gosh, we don't know. We're trying to figure it out. Um, so what I'm hopeful for uh, and, you know, is that it was just a bad year. A lot of people think a very wet spring sort of uh, gave rise to the conditions to really help the nematodes and that hurt the trees. Um, I'm hoping that's the case, but we have to make plans, right, as, as if we're going to kind of maintain our forest um, structure. Um, so what we did at the Science Museum of Long Island, and I was grateful for the opportunity, is, is replanted co-associated species under the canopy. Um, so, you know, we did it here on, at the Science Museum because we were concerned because that beautiful tributary that I mentioned that feeds into Leeds, Leeds Pond, the, the hillside that's adjacent to it is held up basically by American beech trees. So the concern was that if these trees die, Basically, the, the hill would fall into this tributary, really impairing the ecological health. Um, so we planted uh, oaks and tulip poplar and some of these other species in the understory. Um, we got to pay attention to recruitment. Uh, so uh, a lot of the, the understories, especially in like eastern Long Island, where there's a high prevalence of deer, uh, there's not a lot of recruitment of these forest species. So we, we have to, in, in my opinion, we need to go plant under these understories so that we don't just lose these habitats. Um, and, and we're hoping that uh, there's some resistant beech trees. Uh, this, this started in Ohio in like eight years ago or so. And um, there are some stands of trees that seem to be unafflicted by the beech leaf disease, despite in close proximity beaches that are afflicted by it. So um, perhaps we can have some breeding program with the resistance. Um, there's a couple, uh, and I'm a little bit dubious about this in, in for like a forest kind of tract, uh, but there, is, there has been some efficacy shown by uh, a couple uh, fungicides. So agrifos and uh, broadform are two, uh, two chemicals that you might think about using to save a beech tree. Generally speaking, it might be best for landscape style trees, but in a place like the Science Museum of Long Island where we have maybe 30 trees, uh, perhaps it's worth uh, looking into this. Uh, and then, you know, transgenetic beech trees. Uh, I was on calls with the DEC and this uh, SUNY ESF, uh, and apparently they can do this. They can do a transgenetic beech tree to make it nematode resistant. Um, you know, sounds easy for me. I didn't, you know, I'm a macroecologist, right? But um, this might be the future. Uh, you know, we, we've heard of Dutch elm disease, you know, the, uh, the chestnut blight, of course, beech leaf disease. 
you know, add the, the ashes with the emerald ash borer. Uh, unfortunately, we continue to introduce these pathogens, and uh, it might be that our forests uh, have to be genetically, uh, genetically modified and replanted. Uh, so, and, and I'm okay with this, provided that you know we do this from a from an evidence-based standpoint, and we're really careful about unintended consequences. But this is going to be the future, and the, the good news is, I think here is that again, humans have an enormous capacity uh, to affect change. And, and just to bring the presentation home, I want to talk to you all about bringing nature home, right? I stole the tag, one of the taglines from uh, Douglas Talame, who's you know a big inspiration of mine. Uh, Nature's best hope is a big, big plug for that novel, a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, so this is actually in the, in the uh, audience here is Marshall Brown, uh, the executive director of the Long Island Conservancy. This is his house, uh, and this is a seeded meadow that uh, two years ago, was it? Uh, was, was at, was, yeah, it was about two. December 2020, it was still a driveway. Yeah, it was a driveway in December 2020, and now it's this, uh, this beautiful meadow. Um, you see a bunch of, um, a bunch of milkweed, uh, butterfly weed, and then a, a bunch of uh, a little blue stem, big blue stem, uh, but what we do in our own houses make a big difference. Uh, and so, you know, can you imagine if we all had a meadow or a forest in our land, even if it's just a little five by five patch in your yard? If everybody in the yard in the neighborhood um, had a patch like that, suddenly, it would, you know, it would scale up to some incredible ecosystem processes. So, what can you do in your yard? Um, addition by subtraction. The single best thing that you can do to uh, encourage ecosystem health is getting rid of the darn invasive species. And uh, gosh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, well, this particular plant is not invasive in my yard. The big one is burning bush. There are some people like it because you know, in the fall, it looks pretty for a week, and then it looks like this nondiscreet, nondiscreet uh, weed plant. But uh, the birds eat the berries, fly across you know, into the forest, poop, and then there's burning bush everywhere. Uh, so addition by subtraction, you know, you can make a huge difference just by getting rid of the invasive species. Uh, and be lazy. Let me give you an excuse not to rake. All these butterflies uh, are, are in pollinators are overwintering in the leaf litter that's in your yard, right? Uh, so just leave the leaves to the extent that you can. Um, you can push them into beds. If you don't have enough beds for all your leaves, it means your beds need to be bigger is really what it is, right? Uh, and and if, if the only time you walk over that patch of lawn is to mow it, probably doesn't need to be lawn, right? Um, so be lazy. It's good for nature. Uh, one piece of advice I give to a lot of people, um, just, you know, I won't repeat this, but the, uh, if you have room for one tree, you have room for three trees. Plant in clusters. The trees will be happier. The ecosystem will be happier. Um, and, and I should leave you with this. Any of your neighbors would be into this. And, and it probably won't be a surprise uh, in a neighborhood like Port Washington. It's pretty progressive from this, uh, from this standpoint. Uh, lots of native plants, you know, Rewild Long Island does a great job, uh, the Science Museum certainly. Uh, so I read a paper and I couldn't find the reference. I, I can find it if anybody's really that interesting. But uh, basically what, they, what the, the researchers did was they, they showed people in a neighborhood um, pictures of different planting regimes. So basically they took a picture of a house and they, um, they superimposed different planting regimes. So it was, it, just to make it simple, they had the, the typical prototypical Long Island sort of, uh, you know, lawn with a token Japanese maple, and then they had like a native planting scenario. And they showed everybody in the neighborhood and asked what their preference was. What would you rather have? Would you rather have the native planting scenario, or would you rather have prototypical lawn? Uh, and overwhelmingly, uh, the survey was that uh, people would rather have the, the more natural look, this romantic garden with these beautiful perennial plants and stuff. Uh, the second question that they asked in that research paper was, do you think your neighbors would hate you for it if you had the, the, the more natural community? And uh, overwhelmingly, despite everybody in the neighborhood saying they'd much rather it be natural, uh, everybody said that their neighbors would hate them for it. Uh, and so you know, people are actually into this. And so as it's really about education. It's about you know, starting where you live, um, volunteering at the, the Science Museum of Long Island. Goodness, there's a lot of invasive plants to go. So you know, we got volunteer hours. Get your kids down to the Science Museum uh, and, and really do what you can uh, in your little neck of the woods, even if it's a small thing, as small as removing one burning bush uh, in the aggregate will make an incredible difference for the environment. And you know, so, so thank you so much for letting me go through this. Appreciate it. And
Happy to. Happy to entertain questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Frank. I don't know about the rest of you. I just learned a, a heck of a lot that I did not know before this. So that was terrific. Um, if folks here have any questions, just raise your hand and I'll come around uh, with the mic and then we'll check in with the folks on Zoom for their questions. Take your time to keep any contamination yeah. of the mic from occurring. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jim Maloney. I, first of all, thank you so much for getting rid of the kudzu. Yeah. The kudzu, I, I go down there a lot and I've run past the kudzu at least a thousand times. Right. And it's wonderful to see no kudzu. Which right. Is, you know, fantastic. Yeah. Um, you mentioned several times this uh, beautiful tributary. Uh -huh. the, the problem with the be beautiful tributary is the effluent of the affluent flow into it. And what you have is, you mentioned lawns. All of the fertilizers from the lawns right. flow down around Aspen Gate over there, if you know right. the geography, go into that pipe, go out into Leeds Pond. Right. August of this year, I took pictures of, I guess, about a thousand. Well, I didn't take a picture of every fish, but there was a fish kill in, 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 um, in Manhasset Bay. In Manhasset Bay, right. And I'm pretty convinced that most of the fertilizer that gets into Manhasset Bay is coming through Leeds Pond. Right. Um, the, the, the runoff that goes through that tributary is loaded with what people use in their lawns. I have seen suds. Right. You know, I've seen a right. lot of stuff. I go down there, you know, for the past 10 years couple times a week, run the trails, sure. uh, hop in between the fence and stuff and go over the beach. So I see a lot. I'm the passive thing. I watch. Right. Uh, I've met a lot of the wildlife. I saw a fox family grow up, all kinds of stuff. But I, I'm really convinced that that Leeds Pond uh, influx of, of stuff that causes the fish kill. As you know, fish kill is caused by uh, fertilizer. Then you get an algae bloom. And sure. then the Menhaden, the bunker, they swim into the Manhattan Bay and they all die. Sure. And that has happened numerous times. The last one I, I was down there was in August. I think August 25th, I just looked at my phone. Right. Um, so what my question to you is, could we consider down the road, I mean, you got a lot of projects, phytoremediation where that stream goes into something that takes stuff out before you go into Leeds Pond? Either that or convince the people not to use their lawn fertilizer and let it run down, but I think maybe, I yeah. don't know, that well, might that, happen. That, that, might, that might be hard, the convincing people. Um, you know, so interesting too, the, um, the lawn fertilizer is the, one of the sources of input, but even if you don't fertilize your lawn, the fact that your lawn is essentially concrete from a stormwater standpoint, especially this time of year in the winter, right? It's rock hard. Um, so that nitrogen that's falling out of the air just just runs off. So I, I, I do think that we have to, you know, hit it at its source. Um, in terms of, you know, phytoremediation, it, it's interesting. Um, this is sort of unrelated to a certain extent. Yeah, Spadefoot Design and Construction um, has just entered in an exclusive uh, agreement with a company called N by Organic Catalyst, uh, and and, uh, and I'm sorry, N by Organic. And basically, what it does is it uh, it takes the microbiology and this like this SDI, this unit, basically this box, right? Um, and it it pumps in water, about 20 gallons, uh, and within the box, there's sort of this. Um, this incubation, right? It, so the, the microbiology, the, the bacillus bacteria that would do well best with that uh, that water gets it starts to flourish. It gets pumped back out, you know. So we augment the uh, the system, and then it iteratively adapts over time. Um, and so so the answer, I think, uh, is a clear yes. I think we can take down that organic matter uh, with this technology, uh, and we you know we have to have to have to limit also the the inputs too, right? So it's both. Um, so I, I, I think um, I think there's a lot to be done there, and it, it involves you know planting native plants, limiting the stormwater, educating people, and perhaps utilizing a techno technology like in bioorganic. Thanks. Yeah. Well, one thing I'm, I'm certainly struck by here is that nature has a really good system in place, and we come along and and muck it up. Um, right. you know, as, as we're able to re restore that balance, it really has a beautiful way of uh, continuing to, to maintain that balance. Right. Um, so in terms of uh, the stormwater uh, pollution and runoff that you're talking about, um, you know, and again, maybe for folks that aren't as familiar, it, that really is like the primary source of pollution in our waterways, really, is stormwater runoff. Is that it's, correct? It's, um, so there's three major sources. So it's um, wastewater, and as I mentioned, uh, there's there's a, con a connection between stormwater and wastewater. Um, so wastewater comes in a couple ways. So it, it either gets sent to the, the facility and, you know, the, the wastewater treatment plant and then dumped out. Um, you know, at, at, they meet their permit requirements, but it's still a lot of nitrogen getting dumped in, uh, or through the septic systems. The other thing is fertilizer input, so artificial input of nitrogen waste. 
But stormwater is the big thing uh, in my mind because it's it's really you know it's really tied into all this, right? Uh, and so you know stormwater is really is thought to close beaches, like so all of these um, you know fecal coliform issues where you know you have these public health that's stormwater, right? That's the, you know that's the poop that we're swimming and that's from the stormwater. So it's a huge it's a huge issue and uh, a lot of people, uh, especially in the advocacy world, um, you know when I'm when I was up there for this uh, for this uh, this project, at, you know the, the 145 West Shore Road, talking about stormwater. I think some of the board might have glazed, glazed over a little bit, but it's it's a critically important um, factor, and and you know absolutely we got to figure it out. Well, I, I think it has to do something with the fact that we uh, you know maybe historically imagine these gigantic industrial outfall pipes pouring you know toxins directly into waterways, and that that was the source of water pollution, whereas the stormwater, I mean, yes, you can find outfall pipes where you do see, you know, pollution right. reaching into the waterways. But otherwise, it's very, you know, invisible yeah, in so it's, many it's ways. It's non-point, yeah. So the Clean Water Act did a great job in the end of the pipe, regulating the end of the pipe stuff, right? Like, so these outfalls. Um, really, the big hole is everything else, right? And so um, it starts in your yard. You know, so if you every one of your downspouts, if you can kind of collect it into a rain barrel, it doesn't take much. It takes a lot of people doing a, a little bit, and then together we can really make a difference. So I'm just going to check with John upstairs to see if there's some questions on Zoom. Yes, uh, first is not a question, but it uh, is from Kristen Laird, the executive director, and she just wants to thank Frank for all the amazing work he does for the Science Museum of Long Island. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Kristen. The next question is a two-part question. What about deer control? And can the soil conditioner machine be rented for use on meadows for restoration? Um, so, so I mean, certainly you could hire speed, but um, <laughs> right, uh, but but yeah, I think most rental facilities will have them as well. Uh, you got you need an equipment floater insurance to get rent them yourself. Um, but yes, they could definitely be rented. They're they're pretty uh, standard landscaping tool. Apparently, it's used for making lawns essentially. As far as deer control. Um, so yeah, it needs to happen. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of uh, introducing predators. I, I think that I might be in a minority here on Long Island. Um, certainly, we um, we fence our, our little baby plantings. Uh, we use a lot of you know temporary deer fence with rebar and to wire, especially our, out at, out east. We're very limited in our um, our plant choice. You know, there's just a few species that are deer resistant uh, that we can use. Um, you know, it, it's, it's funny because when I was an undergraduate intern um, for the Fish and Wildlife Service, I actually um, I attended a public need, meeting regarding a uh, controlled hunt at Wertheim uh, National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and somebody asked me, like, um, well, hey, why do we need to do this? Well, I explained, you know, these deer are, un, un, we're, we basically, as, as humans, we create this edge habitat that makes, you know, happy deer zones. Um, and so they, they have a very high reproductive potential. Uh, they, they, they explode in their populations, and the unfortunate uh, reality is that a lot of them die slowly and cruelly over the winter of starvation, right? And that's why, you know, they're so desperate and eat all of our plants, right? And so uh, I said, what's more cruel, uh, you know, taking some of these deer out and donating to the homeless shelter or, or you know, letting them die slowly? and. I got called a murderer by somebody <laughs> from PETA, uh, and I was like, I'm just an intern here. But um, you know, deer control is an absolute necessity. Um, you know, ideally there'd be some, uh, you know, contraception perhaps. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm not a. They, we got to do something though because they're destroying ecosystem function all across Long Island and elsewhere. So I just want to follow up on that question, and I'll get to you. Um, so in in terms of the wildlife at the the science museum. Uh, has there been already any impact in terms of what restoration you've done already on any of the local wildlife, or what would you hope would be some of the positive impacts on the local wildlife? Yeah, well, I can tell you that Peggy's garden is crawling <laughs> with the pollinators. That thing is buzzing with life. Um, but it's it's amazing how quickly it happens, right? Like so, um, but it's subtle, right? So uh, we, we're, we're establishing these beautiful tracts of forest, and it's going to take a little bit of time for the, the pollinators to find them. 
you know, but there'll be more pollinators, more wild, more birds, certainly. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, once you reestablish the system, the, the critters will come. And it's just a matter of years. Can I say that the work has increased the abundance of, you know, or diversity of birds? I can't, and so we haven't done that research. Uh, but anecdotally, I can tell you in, in places that we've worked, my own house, you know, I moved in and it was like basically lawn the whole thing, and then I restored it. You know, we got hummingbirds and fox and all kinds of stuff in like suburban Huntington, right? Like, you know, where, where it's not really expected. So, um, so I think the answer is yes. Uh, do we have something to point to? Not necessarily. Okay, and a question. Sure. Um, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, you know, like all of us, um, I drive along Plandome Road and I pass the preserve. And I was curious about two things I see. I noticed that you took a lot of trees down right above where there's some like chicken wire type of thing holding a rock ledge. I was wondering why that was done. And then number two, they put up a railing on Leeds Pond where the outflow is on both sides of the street. And then part of it was taken down. And I was just curious, why would anybody put up a railing and then take it down? So I see that all the time. and. I just wonder if you had any input sure. on that. Uh, so, so maybe Mac can speak to the pond thing. I don't. I have no idea. Um, and I can talk about the, the gabions. So I can I can take the question about the trees also. If oh you yeah, want. go yeah. for it. Yeah. So the um, it was a uh, you're probably talking about a couple of large black locust trees that were located kind of right at that hairpin turn on that entrance driveway. And the, well, uh, so those were taken down basically to because when we bring trucks up there, they can't navigate that turn. Yeah, yeah, so those, those are called gabion baskets. So that was a section of wall. Yeah, no, there, there were no, there were no, no trees above that. No, no, that was um, vines, basically. Yeah, uh, so interesting question. Um, the reason that those gabion baskets are there was because that wall collapsed a couple of years ago because of essentially uncontrolled stormwater building up hydro pressure behind that wall and then pushing it over. Uh, as far as the railings around Leeds Pond, I don't know if I can really answer that one. That's, uh, I think that's a town of North Hampstead question. Um, they were the ones who were responsible for replacing the culvert that went, you know, connects Leeds Pond to the, the bay. Um, and those railings were put in at that time. I don't know. I think they chose those wooden ones because they're more scenic than the metal guardrails, but I don't know why they pulled them out. Mystery. Um, John, I check again. Do you have any other questions up there on Zoom? Yes. Uh, Christina really enjoyed the presentation, and uh, you touched upon endangered salamanders on Long Island. Can you tell us more? Oh, yeah. I, 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 mean, I studied herpetology in graduate school, so it's, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, so, you know, the, the, big, the big one is the tiger salamander. Um, they mostly exist out east at this point, um, you know, in the, the Pine Barrens. So uh, salamander, these, these species of salamanders are, uh, in, have very uh, nuanced, I, I guess, uh, complex habitat requirements. So they breed in the uh, in vernal pools, like these temporary wetlands. Uh, but they live in the in the terrestrial habitat surrounding the vernal pools for the vast majority of the year. So if you don't have either the vernal pools or the terrestrial habitat, um, you're not going to have the salamanders. Uh, this part of the island, I would be surprised to see uh, tiger salamanders, but there's state listed species, marbled salamanders. Uh, you know, we probably don't have a ton of good habitat for it at the Science Museum of Long Island anymore. However, um, Hempstead um, Hempstead Woods. Uh, my colleague David Hakim has uh, done a, extensive work out there and uh, noted some vernal pools and there's some some beautiful terrestrial habitat there too. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were marbled salamanders and spotted salamanders in that area, and certainly other smaller, more common plethodontid salamanders, like you know those little redback salamanders that you see in the woods under the logs all the time. Um, salamanders, I'll say though, are are uh, Eco, are thought to be eco-indicators. So, um, you know, because of the environmental uh, degradation and habitat destruction and fragmentation, uh, they're just not here anymore. Um, that, you know, in, in, you know, there, there are 
locally abundant, uh, but unfortunately regionally rare, just as, as a whole uh, class of amphibians. Another question over here. I just want to say this whole presentation is like a big Christmas present to me. Uh, I haven't been to the um, Science Museum property really in about 20 years. Um, but to see the work that you're doing is just marvelous. It's just very, makes me very happy. I just want to know who's funding it? Yeah, so it's a mixed bag. I mean, um, and, and it's funny you say the work that I'm doing. I mean, I'm, I'm just so grateful for the, the collaboration of the Science Museum. Um, who's funding it? So some of it is donations to directly to the Science Museum, and they're they're taking it out of their own budget. Um, the Long Island Sound Futures Fund is a is a good uh, is a funder. They did a lot of the um, the stormwater work there, um, and then the Nassau County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, the forest regeneration stuff, um, both those plots were supported by grants uh, by the Nassau County Soil and Water Conservation District and, you know, but uh, private donors, so, you know, uh, you said it's a Christmas present, so yeah, get, no, get back like, to the well, org. Yeah. It's like a 180 yeah. degree change in terms of how Nassau County was treating uh, Leeds Pond Preserve yeah. and uh, the allowances it didn't allow the Science Museum to do 20 years ago. So right. But the, other thing is, uh, and this is the only way I know how to name them, are there any Coliseum lizards left on Coliseum the property? Coliseum lizards? The Italian wall lizards? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're are? Like yeah. They are, okay. They're, they're invasive, though. They're in yeah. No, 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 no. They're, <laughs> they're getting in the ecosystem. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, he does, yeah. And, and then the third question is, you mentioned volunteerism. Uh, are there meetings where you spell out how we can volunteer our time and our effort yeah. uh, to help rid invasive species and stuff? So, so is there like a good, uh, maybe Matt, you can take that one too. Is there a good way to um, get in touch with the with Kristen or the org? No, sorry, you're the board member here, so. Uh, yeah, sure, so um, I mean, I would give people my email address, but they will never remember it, but um, call, call Kristen Laird and she'll probably put you in touch with me. Yeah, or, or thank my, you. Okay, yeah, great. And my email address is here too, of yeah, course. So yeah, so uh, the other, um, Paul Merkelson, who's part of Transition Towns, um, uh, Paul and I kind of oversee a kind of an Adopt-A-Trail program at SMLI where we uh, basically assign people to a, a stretch of trail and then say you're responsible for maintaining it uh, and keeping the invasives off of it and things like that. And you kind of, the nice thing about it is you, you do that when you can. Um, so if you have two hours on an afternoon on a nice day, you come down, something like that. So uh, so if you know Paul, he's a good person to get in touch with also. Just one other question. 20 years ago, you gurgled a lot of the Polynesian maples. Yep. Did they ever die? Uh, they, yeah, I'm sure they did. They are probably like eaten by the kudzu monster uh, because there was a ton of, a ton of them in there, but they're just, they're like garbage weed trees. They're like, they grow so fast. Know, and yeah. yeah, no, you, 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 you did good work, and um, there's a bunch of bigger Norway maples on the ground. So, you know, I, I, I don't, I hadn't noticed any particular, good, Matt, you spent. Yeah. Yeah. Come, gr yeah. Come girdle more. Gorilla gardening. <laughs> so, they are, yeah. It's, it's it's unfortunately and pretty pretty ubiquitous on Long Island. So another question over here. Uh, two things actually. I can confirm the at least at one point existence of salamanders on the property. Um, I first started as an educator at SMLI in 2010, and we would go down into that tributary to go hunting for salamanders. I must have been there at the where the turnover where they were no longer going to be found, but co-workers I had at the time that had been working there for many years would find salamanders there and it was you know great because it meant that the water was clean at that time sure. so it's very interesting then to hear that there's possibility for them to come back which is exciting yeah. um, I could be wrong about this but from my knowledge one of the things that is really frustrating about Norway maples is that they release stuff into the soil that prohibits saplings from establishing that symbiotic relationship with a mycorrhizal fungal network. Right. If that's true, does that really pose a challenge then with trying to 
take this forest, which is so Norway maple dominant, and bring it the opposite way. Yeah. It's like it would be a dream come true for it to be an American chestnut forest instead of right. a Norway maple forest. But well, we're how that. how would you factor if that is true? It, like how you factor that into making these plans to restore these areas? It's a great question. We just basically knock over the Norway maple. Forest. <laughs> I wondered. I wondered if it was just as simple as removing them, or like the yeah. root networks are still going to be there, and you know. So, so I think it's a, the term is allelopathic. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, yeah, fuzzy on that. Uh, but I, I know from my experience, we actually plant under Norway maple canopies, and um, you know, it's really the shade that um, that, uh, in my opinion, anyway. I mean, there's definitely some allelopathy going on, but you know, you get rid of those. I mean, we that the the first plot. I mean, that I showed you with those beautiful oak trees that are doing really well, putting on all its growth. Um, Two years ago, that was just a, a stand of Norway maple mm -hmm. with burning bush. So yeah, it's, I, I don't think it has lasting impact that's, on the soil. That's good to hear because yeah. for a while, like working, I just felt like, okay, well, this forest is just doomed. Then, if my thought is that you know the soil has been compromised in a way, right. but it's good to know that the other trees have a chance. They do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. So one other question I had uh, for you, Frank. So I, again, I want to applaud you and obviously everybody that is involved in whether volunteering or, or your professional work there, restoring uh, the property there. Uh, is the, the type of work that Spadefoot is doing, is this widespread? Are there other communities, other companies that are doing this type of restoration and removal of invasive species? Well, well, that that's that's hard because uh, you know you're you're making me <laughs> talk about yeah. So so look, I I, I think what we do is um, sort of novel in that I, I really try to everything we're doing has the the basis in biological science and and, and rigor. Um, there are a lot of great uh, design firms out there. You know, I, I can give I can give some love to Nelson and Pope. They have um, actually a board member of, of Nelson and Pope, but Rusty Schmidt does a good job. Uh, but they you know they don't have um, we have, we have the labor, we have trucks, we have machines and whatnot. So I, there's really not a design build firm out there. There are some that do more big municipal projects that we're trying to break into at this point. We're a fairly young company, but um, and I, hopefully uh, it doesn't come off as too self-aggrandizing uh, to say that I, I think there's really, this is sort of a novel practice here on Long Island. Well, that's fantastic. And again, I, I hope that there are many more in non-competitive areas in other states yeah. um, that, that follow your lead, because I think you're clearly, uh, 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 please uh, uh, avoid the pun here, but uh, blazing a path um, that I think uh, is, is a progressive one and one that I think is part of the, the future of uh, management. Yeah, and, and necessary. If we don't do this, you know, they, we're fighting a war against invasive species all across Long Island that most people don't realize we're doing, right? Um, I'm not saying spadefoot. I'm saying like humanity on Long Island. Like people just don't recognize this, and so educating people um, is really the the fundamental thing that I think we do differently. And um, working with an organization like the Science Museum of Long Island affords me the opportunity, and I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I think we'll um, start. To, oh, I have another question here. Hi, sorry. Um, I don't know if this is an easy answer, but or like if this is general knowledge. But when you were saying um, to get everything that you've taken down is an expensive process to like take out yeah. of the property, then you said like it's normally a ten thousand dollar job, and then I went down to two thousand dollars. Why wouldn't you want to do like a controlled burn or something like that? Because would it like disrupt the soil, or is it too? Could get too out of hand. I, yeah, I mean, my insurance company would not like that one. <laughs> yeah. um, and but moreover, I, I don't know that it would really be effective, right? Like I, I think, um, yeah, I, I I can't imagine using. Um, right. You, you know, um, garlic mustard. Uh, if you if you beat up the seed bank and plant native uh, aggressive native species that would be invasive elsewhere. Um, white snake root, and I showed the fleabane daisy. I've actually noticed on a lot of our sites, these species are out competing the garlic mustard. Yeah. Um, burning, I, I just, I'm a little skeptical, uh, you know, like I can't, no, no, it's a, it's a great question because it's definitely a tool. I learned about it a lot in college. I went for environmental science, yeah. so it's just I never really knew like why, sometimes you really do choose that route and sometimes you don't. 
I also wanted to say thank you for bringing up the mycorrhizal network because that's like my favorite thing and no one ever it's talks so about cool, it. Right? So thank yeah. you very much. I loved seeing it up there. Yeah. So thank you. Sure. So uh, I want to um, you know finish off here by um, uh, thanking Margaret, uh, Margaret Galbraith, um, Hildor, uh, the Science Museum of Long Island, and uh, can we have another round of applause? Applause for Frank thank Piccinini. You. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody. We were able to record tonight's program, so this will eventually find its way to the library's YouTube page. Um, a couple of the other Transition Town programs, the Hempstead Harbor Woods program is up there. You can find it. Uh, thank you all again for spending we, some of we your We have evening. some uh, links as well from uh, Science Museum of Long Island, who is uh, fundraising for removal of invasives. Uh, private donors can invest uh, at... Uh, smli.org backslash uh, contact dash us uh, p maslow p m a s l o w s at gmail.com for volunteers adopt a trail program uh, at transition town pw.org Info at. Yeah, okay. And uh, please visit the website at smli.org. Join as a member or volunteer. Terrific. Thanks, John. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great night. We hope to see you at some other programs. Thanks so much.